We'll continue in the Gospel of Mark. Those are just two of our missionary families that we support at Swiss Church. Mark and Cheryl Robinson. Cheryl used used to be a Clawson, is that right? Cheryl used to be a Clawson, so many of you guys know Cheryl and, and Mark just doing an incredible ministry. Great, great picture of the restored temple in Jerusalem in the skyline there. Obviously, that's a, a fake photo of Jerusalem, but a really cool aspect of their uh, uh, studio that they have in Raleigh, North Carolina, and the ministry they continue with Jewish awareness. Next week, we're going to hear from Adam and Chelsea Lair. They're also um, in ministry with, with Jews. They were in, with Life and Messiah last year. They're going to tell us a little bit about their ministry, and Greg and Amy Cole are going to share a little bit about what's going on in China and some, uh, some stuff that uh, they're doing in their mission work there as well. And so we're excited to hear from from everybody, hopefully be a good, exciting month to keep our missionaries before you and uh, keep praying for them and keep supporting them here at Swiss Church. Um, Mark chapter 13 is where we'll be today. We're going to try to cover this whole chapter. Olivet Discourse is what this is known as in Scripture. If, uh, if some of you have heard that term before and some of you haven't, it's uh, uh, one of the longest sermons in the Gospel of Mark. From Jesus, we'll try to tackle the whole thing. We'll be a little sporadic, jumping around, but a lot of verses in Scripture. So, so bear with me as we go through Mark 13, and let me pray as uh, we begin in the text this morning. Father in heaven, um, again, we thank you for your Word. We thank you for uh, just working in our life through the Word. Um, we pray that our time here would would not just be reading the text and and learning new facts or gaining some intellectual advantage that we didn't have before, but that really the, the words of Scripture would change our lives, that we'd leave different people that we came in, that um, this would just be a, a one aspect of what happens on a daily basis in our life, that we spend time in your Word, uh, learn it, grow from it, meditate on it, memorize your Scripture, and that we'd be transformed individuals because of the power of your Word to minister in people's lives. God, uh, thank you for each and every one of our missionaries. Just want to pray especially for Mark and Cheryl this morning as they continue to minister in Raleigh, North Carolina. I think they're actually hosting a, a tour back to Israel this week. Um, and so just give them traveling mercy. Help it to be a great trip and, and use that to draw many people to yourself. In that, we want to pray for um, Paul and Beth Wright in Argentina as well, that they would continue their work in Mendoza and, and with the Bible Institute there that's um, just growing and, and a huge aspect of the mission's work that they're carrying off there as well. Just bless them. Uh, let the gospel be very evident through their lives. Um, let it be opening deaf ears and do the work that you have created it to do through the lives of people and, and giving life to otherwise dead hearts and dead lives. God, we, uh, we thank you for the truth of the gospel that we have. And we pray all these things to you, Father, through the Son and by the Spirit. Amen. Mark 13. So many of you have uh, experienced the joy of beginning new life in this world, of bringing new life into this world. The, uh, the stages of pregnancy where our, our wives just have that glow about them as they bring in life into this world. Sarah McAvoy, of course, with child this time, Jan- Janelle with child, just this glow that these um, ladies have, and Sarah. Uh, it's just amazing, um, and many of you have have had the joy of growing your family with children, and the joy of holding your baby for the first time, whether it's an adopted child or a, by natural birth. There's nothing quite like the joy that we experience as parents of bringing life into this world. Somewhere between the time when you hold your baby for the first time, and you leave the hospital room, end of the first week of pregnancy, of having your baby, that joy sort of of transitions a little bit. If you're anything like me, uh, that joy became something like, okay, uh, this, this is what it is to raise a newborn. And to raise a new baby, um, Brandy and I bought into this philosophy of raising children called Baby Wise. Uh, my sister was the first one to refer us to this book, Baby Wise. Uh, she basically said, gave us this book and kind of said, if you do not do this philosophy for raising your kids, uh, don't bring your kids to our house for the first four years of their life because we don't want to see them. Uh, some of you guys have probably experienced this when you're pregnant. Uh, dads and moms go through this. Um, Basically, everybody that you come across in life, their God-given purpose and direction is to tell you exactly how to raise your kids in every step, in every way. And so, enter my sister here. Um, 
she gives us this book, Baby Wise. Uh, we took it, we read it, we read it again. Uh, we took notes, highlights the third time we read it and decided that this is how we were going to raise our babies. Uh, the subtitle of the book for Baby Wise is so something like this, giving your infant the gift of nighttime sleep. And I thought, man, yeah, I want to give that to my kid. I want to give that to myself. I want to give that to my wife, and that would be great if we could sleep through the night. Um, over and over again, the the uh, resounding line, the chorus through this book, as you read Baby Wise, is the, the first eight weeks is super hard. It's uh, one of the hardest times that you'll go through in raising a child. Uh, baby's stomach is growing. There's so many feedings when they're little. There's cycles. You're three hours around the clock feeding, feeding, feeding. They can't talk, of course. They're just screaming, trying to tell you uh, what's going on. All that to say, infancy has one of, been one of the toughest times in our marriage for me and Brandy. Uh, for eight weeks, those those first stages, there's there's very little sleep in our house when we have a baby. The uh, uh, the littlest, most innocent comments turn into just um, WWF cage cage matches. Wake up in the morning. You guys know this. Babe, what's going on today? What's going on? What's going on today? <laughs> Brandy's like, I'm a Holstein. That's what's going on today. I'm a milk factory. I'm going to get it spit up on by... F- Five times by three o'clock in the morning and not going to see the light of day and you're asking me what's going on today. You come to our house in the first eight weeks of a baby, it's a war zone. All right, so you might be shot just uh, just in case you're wondering. Brandy was actually really great. It really went went well with our uh, with our babies. I'm just, just going to throw that out. This is emphasis for exaggeration from the pulpit here. Um, but over and over again, Baby Wise just told us, just hang on. Through the first eight weeks, um, the writer said you can spend the first three years not getting any sleep of the baby's life, or you can spend eight weeks not getting any sleep. And so, man, we're we're going for eight weeks and trusting that this thing is going to work, and and just get through the first eight weeks. Just dig down deep. Just keep going. Just persevere through eight weeks. And sure enough, Henry, our our first baby, seven weeks three or four days comes along and he's sleeping like eight hours through the night. I'm like, oh my goodness, this, it actually worked. And and how's it going, babe? Turned into, oh, it's, it's going pretty well. What can I make you for lunch? And all, it was great. And Ethan came along and, and sure enough, again, week seven and he's sleeping through the night. Same with Kennedy. It was wonderful. God in his grace brought us through unscathed with a promise from baby wise to just persevere through the first eight weeks. Um, we're going to look at Mark 13 this morning and Jesus will prophesy the destruction of the temple and the destruction of Jerusalem. And just like baby wise told us as parents to persevere, Jesus is going to tell his followers, just persevere. It's going to get really difficult and it's going to get really tough. I'm taking down my temple. My city is going to be destroyed with fire. Just persevere. Just find a way to live through the chaos. Destruction and wrath are coming. Jerusalem will be a war zone. This is a a coup d'etat, what they say in France. A strike against the state, against the state of Rome and against the state of the Jewish nation, even the Jewish people there. And when you see certain things happening, be on guard, be aware, and persevere. Mark 13, of course, has been termed the Olivet Discourse. There is three lengthy sermons that you will find from Jesus in the Gospels. The first lengthy sermon is the one that's probably the most famous to us is the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus reveals himself as the prophet, the prophet of righteousness in the Sermon on the Mount. The second lengthy sermon is the Upper Room Discourse. We have that in John 13 through 17. Jesus reveals himself as the great priest. He's the prophet, Sermon on the Mount. The great priest in the upper room discourse. Here in the Olivet discourse, he is the king who is coming for his people and, uh, and to restore his temple. From the Mount of Olives, Jesus looks at the temple, east of the temple, and he says, this whole thing is coming down. The whole temple system that the Jews have known, all the sacrifices, all the prophets, 
My house has become a den of robbers. The house of prayer has become a den of robbers. It's going down. The hypocrisy of religion had been so horribly compromised with the Jewish people at that time. The only solution for God was complete destruction of the temple and complete destruction of the sacrificial system. It had to be that way. God is about to clean house. And he's going to tell us he's going to clean house in Mark 13. And when he does, he doesn't use a 50 cal. This is a nuke. Not one stone will be left unturned when God is done with his temple and the destruction of it. The prophecy of Mark 13 is what happens when religion trumps relationship with God. When prophets trump purity, when hypocrisy trumps holiness, when high positions trump low hearts as we approach God. The religious leaders had focused on the killer bees of ministry, the temple business, temple busyness, budgets, and buildings. Jerusalem, like Humpty Dumpty, will have a great fall, and nobody is going to be able to pick up the pieces until years and years down the line. We still haven't seen the day when the temple is restored, how Scripture says it will be restored. Jesus says, be on guard. What's about to happen will be devastating, but you must persevere. I am telling you ahead of time that the temple is being destroyed so that when it happens, you will know to persevere and you will know what to do when it occurs. Number one in your outline and and first slide here, Cameron, if you don't mind, I, I forgot my clicker. Be on guard for restoration verses one through four. Look at, uh, Mark 13. Look at verse 1. We're not going to look at all these verses in Mark 13, but hopefully enough to, to paint a clear picture of the context and some, give some applications from the text here. Mark 13, verse 1. And as he came out of the temple, one of the disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings as they looked at the temple. The Greek word wonderful, of course, is, is given two times in this first verse. It implies a question when you read it in Greek. We should read this. From the disciples, can you believe these massive stones? Does anything compare to this building? Some historians have said that the temple should be the eighth wonder of the world. The biggest stones in the temple were measured to be 42 feet long, 14 feet wide, and 11 feet in height. The estimated weight of some individual stones to the temple was 600 tons is the estimated weight to them. Uh, From the east where Jesus is, the uh, temple looked like it had white stones with gold trim around them. Of course, uh, the roof of the temple had a a gold tint to it. And so many people said that the temple looked like a a snow-capped mountain in the distance, especially as the sun is coming up and the sun is setting on the uh, horizon of the temple. Number one to be aware aware of in Mark 13. Beware that the things that man finds impressive, God might not find impressive. Beware that the things that man finds impressive, God might not find them very impressive. Buildings have nothing on the kingdom of God. Buildings have nothing on the church of God in the New Testament. God is not impressed with structures Pastor Jared, if we could, uh, if we could just get our ministry over to the new building, everything would, would flourish. Our ministries here would just go crazy if we could get over to the new building. That's nonsense. Buildings do not equal ministry. When the disciples asked Jesus to look at the temple, in essence, they asked him to look at the hands of men and look at what men have accomplished for God. I find it laughable that the disciples point out the temple to Jesus. <laughs> Walking away from the from the temple, going up the Mount of Olives here. Jesus, man. Do you, do you see? You see the temple? You see this great building that we have erected? Isn't this isn't this unbelievable? Look at his response in verse two. Jesus said to him, Do you see these great buildings? There will not be one stone left upon another that will not be thrown down. No, man, wow, that's an impressive structure. How long did it take you to build that temple? Jesus doesn't say any of that. Notice the verb that he uses in verse 2. Not one stone will be left that is not thrown down. 
He did not say fall down. He did not say roll over. He did not say corrupted. He did not say destroyed. He said thrown down, which leads me to ask this question. Who's throwing it down? Who's throwing the temple down? The answer, of course, is God is destroying the temple. Um, Listen really carefully. God is not opposed to destroying that which once brought him glory when it is corrupted by sin and it is corrupted by man. God is not opposed to destroying something which once brought him glory when sin enters the picture. You see it in the flood right away in Genesis. You see it over and over again. Big churches, massive structures, massive buildings going on. You see it in the story of the temple. When the Jews thought of the kingdom of God in the Old Testament, and certainly right here in the Gospels, they thought of a restored temple. This is a huge aspect of the promises of God coming down through the Old Testament. The temple, this great temple that we have built, that God's temple where the holiness of God resides will one day be restored. This gives us great hope for the people of God. What's crazy is that this is not the first time that the temple is destroyed in Scripture. You see it destroyed once before by the Babylonians, about 600 B.C., 586 B.C., and Nebuchadnezzar comes in and puts the whole thing to flames. Nearly 600 years prior to when Mark writes this book, God raised up the Babylonians, an enemy army, to destroy his temple. Um, Just for clarification, this is not an episode of home improvement. Uh, This is not where... We're rebuilding a, an extra wing onto the east side of the temple here. We're going to take out a wall here and redecorate here. No, no, no. This is extreme home makeover. The whole thing is going down and we're starting from the ground up. His instruments of restoration are not crowbars and sledgehammers. They are wrecking balls, bulldozers, and fire set by the Romans. When God restores the temple, he will start all over from the ground up. Look at verse 3 and 4, Mark 13. He sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, and Peter, James, and John, and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, this is is the temple. This is the place where we have worshipped for so many years. Tell us, when when is this going to happen? What will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? Verses 3 and 4 give you, if you want to highlight one verse for for Mark chapter 13, this is all of Mark 13. When will these things be accomplished? Is, is answering that question, Jesus, to the disciples here. It is all about the temple and the religious system going down, and they want to know when it's going to happen. I've entitled this section, Beware of Restoration. Why not beware of destruction of the temple? Um, the loss of the temple would devastate the typical Jew in the in the Gospels here. But its destruction had a grand purpose for ultimate restoration of God's people, an ultimate restoration of this thing that we call Christianity and how we worship and how we serve God. But its destruction had an ultimate purpose. This is how God works. This is often how God works with people. It is often how he works with churches. It is how he works with his people, the Jews. That when something becomes so corrupted and ruined by sin, he will destroy the whole thing before he starts over new with the restoration process. This is how he works with us in sin, too. He will not stop until he destroys all of it. Until we are completely dead to ourselves and dead to our flesh. Then he will create us with new bodies and restore the entire thing. And so we look forward to restoration in that way. Number two in your outline, number two as we we go on this morning. Next slide there, Cameron. Be on guard for persecution. Be on guard for persecution. Look at verse 9. Verse 9 just starts with this short little phrase, but be on guard. This is the main exhortation for the whole chapter of Mark 13. Look back at verse 5. Jesus began to say to them, see that no one leads you astray. Be on guard. That's the same word there in verse 5, that no one leads you astray. Verse 9, but be on your guard. Verse 23, skip down to verse 23. But be on guard. I have told you all these things beforehand. Look down at verse 33. Same word there. Be on guard. Keep awake. All of these are imperatives in the Greek. They come across as commands. 
The lexicon defines the nuance of this word to be on guard as to be ready to learn about something that is needed or hazardous. Watch out, look, beware of, remain in constant readiness. This is a perpetual command. There is never a time not to be on guard that God is going to come and do something incredible. And so we get ready for it. Look at the end of verse 9, Mark 13. For they will deliver you over to councils. You will be beaten in synagogues. You will stand before governors and kings for my sake. You will bear witness before them. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all the nations. Persecution is directly linked with the gospel in Mark 13. If the gospel is going out, persecution is coming in. These verses are a foreshadowing of what we read right in the book of Acts, almost verbatim at the stoning of Stephen. You'll read these phrases as Paul goes throughout his ministry, being stoned, being persecuted for his faith. This is a prequel to the book of Acts here. Look at verse 11, Mark 13. When they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say. But say whatever is given to you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit speaks. Uh, usually when we hear this, this word quoted, usually I hear it from, from pastors. And when they explain this, this verse, they, uh, they usually get this uh, real soft tone in their voice. And they look me directly in the eye and they say something to the effect of, See, uh, Jared, when I, when I prepare my sermons, I, I don't really worry about what I'm going to say the week before. Um, I don't manuscript, I don't script, I don't uh, put down notes for my sermon. I I go to bed on Saturday night and I sleep on my Bible and I wait to see what page it's going to open up to and and I just wait for the Holy Spirit to minister to my life. Thank you, Jesus. This verse has nothing to do with sermon preparation. Almost nothing to do with sermon preparation. And everything to do with persecution when you are persecuted for the faith. Overly pious preachers make great excuses for laziness, in my opinion. Paul is clear to encourage Timothy as a soldier, an athlete, and a hard-working farmer. You study yourself to show yourself approved by God, a workman who needs not be ashamed. Yes, he will provide words when persecuted, but until that day comes, get busy studying the Word of God, gleaning from the text. This is not a verse we're going to use for small group leaders. Sunday school leaders, different people engaged in ministry here until persecution comes. It's not. It's a verse that we're going to cling to as a promise of God when times get difficult. But until that day comes, get busy in the Word of God. Understand the context. Understand how these things are flowing through. It's just just a rabbit trail. Uh, most of you guys know we married off Emily Harder yesterday. Emily um, Elliot yesterday. i got to get this right now. About two weeks before um, Emily's wedding, the ladies threw her a party as a shower. Uh, many of you guys know you go through these wedding showers, and they're fun things. They're great times to come together. Well, for this shower, of course, Brandy wants to go to the shower, which which means she's going to go at nighttime and leave me with, with three kids. And uh, And she's got a lot of faith in my parenting abilities, more faith than I have. And my parenting abilities, and so she goes to this wedding shower, and, and here I am with the three kids, and the first thing I'm thinking is, oh my goodness, you know, how am I going to survive with three kids? Um, my, my oldest is like seven years old, I haven't done this like barely at all in my life, and so how are we going to survive? So I did this thing, and uh, and you guys are you're just perpetual sermon illustrations, Greg and Amy, now that you're back. So, so I send Greg uh, Cole a text, and I, I had this thought. That if I'm alone with the kids and my wife is at a shower for Emily, then Amy is probably alone. She left Greg alone with the kids and he's probably taking care of the kids as well. So I send Greg this very innocent text and it goes something like this. Greg, what's going on at the coal house for the night here? And, and I get nothing back. Just, th- just throwing a bone out there. Nothing back. About 20 minutes co- goes by and Greg sends this text back and it reads, Oh man, I've got two of my kids in bed and one's getting ready to go down. This is a great night at the Cole residence. Signed, Super Dad. <laughs> didn't, didn't sign it that way, just implied was, was Super Dad. And, and so he's like, what's going on? And I was, and I just kind of sent him a, uh, SOS call. I was like, man, I, you know, Brandy leaves me with the kids and, uh, and I don't know what I'm doing as a dad. And I need some help here. 
And so about another two or three minutes goes by and, and Greg sends me another text. And this text reads this way. And some of you guys will know this very well. It says, there may come a day when the courage of men may fail. <laughs> Quotes Lord of the Rings to the Lord of the Ring quoter up here. I thought, okay, it's time to, time to gear up, Aragon. Let's get to battle. Let's fight. I can make it through here. All that to say, look at verse 12 and 13. Brother will deliver brother over to death. A father, his child, and children will rise up against parents and have them put to death. And you'll be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Just get through these eight weeks. Just persevere. Just continue on. You can do this. I've got my two in bed already. You can do this. You can get through the destruction of the temple. You can get through the fire of Jerusalem. You know it's happening. I've told you about it. Just dig down deep. Far from being a verse on eternal salvation, the one who endures to the end will be saved. Verse 13. That is not talking about our salvation. That is talking about get through the destruction of Jerusalem. Get through the destruction of the temple. I am still with you. I will still be your God. You will still be my people. Just persevere and make it through. Number three in your outline and and number three, next slide here, Cameron. Be on guard for desolation. Look at verse 14. When you see the abomination of desolation standing where it ought not to be, let the reader understand, parenthetical expression there from Mark. Let the reader understand then, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. The great question as we read this verse, verse 14, is what is the abomination of desolation? It has something to do with the temple being desolated, being abominated, if that's even a word. It has something to do with Daniel 9, this prophecy of the abomination of desolation. It appears to be a person in Mark 14, and it must be recognizable enough for people to see what's going on and head and flee to the mountains to get out of there and know that this is happening. Over 170 years prior to Mark's writing, a guy by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes was a Greek king. He came and he took over the temple from the Jews. The first thing he did was he sacrificed pigs on the altar at the temple. That was not a good move if you want to have good relationships with the Jews. You don't sacrifice pigs in the temple system, an unclean animal. First thing he does, he sacrifices a pig on the altar at the temple of the Jews, and there he sets up a statue of Zeus. It was from the Seleucid Empire where the Greeks came in and took over the Jews. It was an abomination of desolation, and it led to the Maccabean Revolt. We've heard about this Maccabean Revolt. We've talked about it in the Gospel of Mark. Mattathias Maccabeus, when he saw the abomination of desolation, when this guy comes in, Antiochus Epiphanes, desecrates the temple, sacrifices a pig on the altar, and puts up a statue of Zeus, he went to war with those guys. You are not going to do this in our land and on our temple. This is not going to continue. Jesus says the very opposite of that. He says, don't fight against them. When you see the abomination of desolation happen again, you run, you flee, and you get out of there. This is altogether different. Jesus wants them to turn and run. Most conservative scholars define the abomination here in Mark 13 as fulfilled in a guy by the name of John of Geshala, who established a desecrated priest offered sacrifices on the altar at that time, took the priesthood away from the Levites, and there was an abomination that happened before 70 A.D., about 68 A.D. in the temple is what what most historians say. Look at verse 15. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down nor enter his house to take anything out when this happens. Verse 16, let the one who is in the field not turn back and take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that it might not happen in winter. For in those days there will be such tribulation as has not been seen from the beginning of the creation that God created until now, and there never will be. If you're at your house, don't worry about locking the door. If the clothes are on the clothesline, don't take them down and bring them in. 
If you're working, don't go home first. If you're pregnant with child, if you're nursing a baby, Lord, have mercy on your soul. Um, a while back, I was given my, my first smartphone as a perk for a job in ministry. And at, and at first, my, my smartphone was really against me. Um, we would go and eat dinner at the dinner table, and I was so enamored by the smartphone, I'd bring out the smartphone and check emails during dinner time and, and check Facebook during dinner time. That got, that got old pretty, pretty quick. And date nights would come about. It's the first thing you do. You pull out your cell phone. That's not a good, good idea. The smartphone was really against me as I got it. Um, and it was really hurting me. But then a buddy of mine came along. I was in college ministry and he, and he showed me everything that I could do with a smartphone. And I was a, a campus pastor. Uh, I was out on campus a lot away from the office. And so I could check my emails on campus being with students. I could, uh, give calendar notifications to Brandy so she knew where I was going. And, and I began to learn, took pictures with college students. Um, the smartphone first really hurt me in my family life, but then it really started to help me under the right boundaries and under the right uh, qualifications. The Romans here in Mark 13 are the very same way. The Romans are clearly God's enemy. They exiled the Jews. They were another Gentile nations. But the Romans who were hurting God's people will now help God in destroying his temple. God will use his enemies, the Romans, now for his glory as the temple is destroyed and desecrated. Rarely in Scripture, listen really carefully, rarely in Scripture will God call his people to turn and run away from chaos and problems. Not Gideon in his 300 Not David and Goliath, not Jonathan and his armor bearer. But here he tells them, when they see the abomination of desolation in the temple, turn and run. And here is why. God is now with the Romans. That might have been a prophecy or something happening there. We've got flies flying around here. God is now with the Romans. And if you fight against the Romans, Jews, you're fighting against God. And what he has determined in his plan, in his purpose, to destroy the temple. And the one time that you stand, that you go and you run away from conflict is when God is fighting against the people, against what is happening there in Jerusalem. What was once against the people of God, the Romans, will now be for the people of God as they destroy the temple. Number four, and next slide. Be on guard for vindication. And I want you to skip down here to verse 23. Verse 23. But be on guard. I have told you all these things beforehand. And in those days after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened. The moon will not give its light. The stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power. In great glory. Then they will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds and from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. This, this uh, section has extreme difficulties in interpreting it. Mark 13 is probably the, the hardest chapter to interpret in the, in the book of Mark, the gospel of Mark. The language here, verses 24 through 27, is what we call apocalyptic. It has to do with the revelation of Christ, the emergence of Jesus into history with graphic metaphors. An example of, of how apocalyptic literature works is very metaphorical. As we would say that 9-11 was a very earth-shattering event. We understand that there was no earthquake on 9-11, but what happened on 9-11 uh, had, had an effect that people felt around the world because of the severity and, and what happened. So we would say that that was an earth-shattering event. The sun being darkened, the moon not giving its light, Many have taken that to be apocalyptic, metaphorical language of political destruction. The Roman Empire would be destroyed. They would destroy the temple. Even the armies around Jerusalem would be destroyed. Scholars are about 50-50 here, if you can track with me. Scholars are about half and half here. Some say that verses 24 through 27 are completely descriptive and fulfilled in 70 AD when the temple is destroyed and Jerusalem is set on by fire. Um, they appeal to verse 30. If you look down to verse 30, truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until these things take place. And so this generation, of course, the generation right there, 
70 AD will not pass away until these things take place. Everything up to this point in Mark 13 had, could easily uh, be solely designated on the destruction of the temple in the chapter, no doubt about it, in 70 AD. Other scholars argue that this is descriptive of the end of the Great Tribulation, the second coming of Jesus. Uh, um, my personal opinion is that verses 24 through 27 refer to the second coming of Christ, foreshadowed in Daniel 7, 13 and 14. And here's why. I just want to give you a few reasons. The other synoptic gospels, Matthew's account of the Olivet Discourse, um, verse 24 and 25, chapters 24 and 25 in Matthew, he gets two chapters on the Olivet Discourse because Matthew is all about the return of the king. This is the sermon for the return of, return of the king. It is all about the second coming in Matthew when that happens. Um, Luke's Olivet Discourse is chapter 21. He, he uses verses that can only be used of the second coming there. And so Mark, I think, 13 is, is used too of the second coming here. Verses 26 and 27, the Son of Man comes. He gathers from the four winds and from the ends of the earth is what your text will say. Uh, these phrases are replete in your Old Testament concerning the, not only the destruction of Jerusalem, but the end time hope of Israel. After the great tribulation, he will gather together the elect, the people that have been spread out after they were, they were spread out from the exiles of the Gentiles. Um, they have, there's more Jews today in New York at times than there is in, in, uh, J- Jerusalem, in Israel. It's, a uh, it's amazing how spread out they are, and they won't come all together from the ends of the earth and be gathered like that until the end of the Great Tribulation. And that's a fulfillment of that, and so I think this is talking about the second coming because of that. Some interpret verse 26. You will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds there. Uh, the same word, Greek word coming can be translated going. Is he coming or is he going in the clouds? And that's a very viable interpretation. Uh, scholars, when they translate the text, you have to decide from the context. Is this translated as coming or is this translated as going? And usually the context is very clear. Here, you know, if, if you're going to take 70 AD as the interpretation, you're going to say the Son of Man is going. If you're going to take the interpretation that this is the second coming, you're going to say that he is coming. Um, when the Son of Man comes to bring hope to his people, it is never when he is going. It is always when he is coming. For God's people to have hope in the Son of Man coming, it always happens when He is coming to them to rescue them and to usher in deliverance and hope. And so I don't think we we translate this as the Son of Man going. That's again why I see second, uh, uh, second coming of Christ in these verses. Whether or not Mark 13 refers to 70 AD in its entirety or the second coming is not really that important. Here's what's extremely important to glean from this passage. It's going to get worse before it gets better. It's going to get a lot worse before it gets better. And the only one who can do anything about the condition of the state of affairs in the world and the hope of mankind and salvation to come, the only thing that can ultimately bring us hope for all the chaos that is going on and all the chaos that will continue to go on is the coming of Jesus Christ for His bride in His glory and for His people to establish His kingdom on the earth from Jerusalem and rule and reign from His city once again and be the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Clearly that every knee will bow and everyone will confess that He is Lord to the glory of the Father. He is in control. We persevere because He told us that this is going to happen. None of this happens out of God's sovereign plan. He is always in control, even in the chaos. And so we take hope in that. C.S. Lewis says, there is a far, far better things ahead than what we leave behind. There is far better things ahead than what we leave behind. And I know you all know this catchy saying. It's on our, our magnets, on our refrigerators. It's on the, the signs that we put in our living rooms. Uh, that when God closes a door, He opens a window. Nothing could be further from the truth in Scripture. Nothing. When God closes a door, He closes a door and that's it. There is no way out. The temple is being destroyed. Jerusalem is going to be raised with fire. There's no window that you're going to be able to escape to. There's no hope for the people. The only hope that you have, 
the only salvation and the rescue that we can glean to is nothing in and of ourself and no glimmers of hope and no signs of light are there, but instead Jesus comes and he returns and he brings hope. He brings rescue in his timing and in his way. When you look at Mark 13, you look at the great hope that we have, that there is nothing that we can do. And God has done it all, and we see that in the gospel. Look at the remaining verses just really quickly, and and we're going to close here in a second. Verse 33, Jesus exhorts his disciples, Be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. Verse 35, Therefore stay awake. You do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or in the morning. Verse 37, I say to you, I say to you all, stay awake, stay awake. As we close here, I um, just want to end with one principle and one really good application, hopefully. And the principle is this. I have to say this as a pastor. It's just, it's just so blatantly obvious in this text. The first, first slide here, Cameron. Things that amaze the world might not amaze God. Keep in mind as you leave this text, things that amaze the world might not amaze God. The disciples thought the temple was amazing, and it was amazing. Eighth wonder of the world, but not necessarily amazing for ministry. Paul said there will come a time when preachers will amaze you with smooth talk and flattery but they deceive the hearts of naive. They teach doctrines contrary to what he himself taught. The goal of the American dream is for people to be amazed by man. The goal of the gospel is for people to be amazed by God. 2 Corinthians 4.18, We look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient. They're here one second. They're gone the next. But the things that are unseen, they are eternal. A.W. Tozer says it better than anybody else. Apart from Christ, let nothing dazzle you. Don't become so enamored by self that you miss the Savior. The things that amaze the world might not amaze God. Number two, prepare today for persecution tomorrow. Prepare today for persecution tomorrow. Uh, John Piper has said, Loss and suffering joyfully accepted for the kingdom of God show the supremacy of God's worth more clearly in the world than all worship and prayer. Loss and suffering joyfully accepted for the kingdom of God show the supremacy of God's worth more clearly in the world than all worship and prayer. There's a pastor in Romania who goes by the name Richard Wormbrand. And much like Bonhoeffer, he took the church underground in Romania when uh, when they came against persecution, the Nazis came in, um, communist government came in and took over. At one time when he took this church underground in Romania, he had 10 to 15 young adults who wanted to join the church, be baptized and join the church. He didn't bring them to a, um, a connections class. He didn't bring them to an elder's house to join the church. He took them to the zoo. And he walked immediately to the lion's cage. And he said to those 10 or 15 young men and women, as they were about to join the church and pledge their allegiance to Christ, he said this, he said, your forefathers suffered and died for their faith. They won't throw you to the lions, but they will throw you to much worse. He said, you need to decide here and now if you wish to pledge allegiance to Christ. He was seized in Romania. Uh, communists captured him, put him in prison for 14 years. Listen to this verse in 1 Thessalonians 3.3. 3, Let no one be moved by these afflictions, for you yourself know that we are destined for this. We are destined to suffer because of the gospel. Persecution is coming. Uh, just about everybody, every Christian in America knows it's just around the corner here in the U.S., the challenge for us is how do we prepare for it? How do we prepare for this time of persecution? Romans 5, 3 and 4 says, We rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces hope. People who suffer well and prepare well for persecution and for the gospel hold on to earthly things very loosely. 
They hold on to earthly things very loosely. What do you have in your life that you need to let go of? Let me think of the rich young ruler in this passage. Uh, He had great many possessions, and so he went away from Christ saddened. Uh, Number two, people who suffer well for the gospel believe that God's promises are true. What promises do you need to cling to today as you prepare for persecution and prepare for suffering? Number three, they pledge their full allegiance to Christ alone. What idols do you have in your life that need to be cast out knowing that persecution is coming? Ben Hogan is one of my favorite golfers. He said, golf tournaments are anticlimactic. They are won or lost in preparation. Matthew Henry says it ought to be the business of every day to prepare for our last day. And it is coming. Persecution is coming. And so I would pray that we would prepare well for that day. Let me pray, and uh, and we'll close with uh, um, that in mind. I want to remind you that our, our offering boxes are in the back there, and so um, you can uh, come leave the same way you came in, in an attitude of worship by giving to the church, if, uh, if that is so on your heart to do so. Father in heaven, um, thank you for this... Uh, Thank you for the Gospel of Mark. Thank you for telling your disciples what was about to take place in Jerusalem. Surely a uh, a horrifying picture for them. Everything the Jews knew, everything they held dear to was in the temple. Uh, Jerusalem is the city of our king. It still is the city of our king. And, and when the Romans would come against it and put it to fire, it just had to be such a horrifying thought and a horrifying experience. You gave them, you told them by your word what was going to happen before it happened to give them hope, uh, to allow them to persevere. And, and you have told us in your word that persecution is coming, difficulty is coming here. And you've told us that to give us hope. Help us to prepare now for the dark days that are coming ahead. Help us to hold our possessions, the things that we hold so dearly, very loosely. Help us to cast the idols out of our life, to live differently because we know that this is not our home this is this place is temporary and you have you have established a permanent residence for us in the kingdom of god help us to look to that instead of these temporary things as we prepare in our lives lord take us from this place this morning and with an attitude of worship uh, let the words of scripture continue to conform our hearts and our image more and more into the image of your son we ask this To you, Father, through the Son and by the Spirit, for you three are the one true God, and there is no God besides you. Amen.